Moth's Misunderstandings, presented by the We Hate Anime Podcast. This week's episode... (laughs) Air Force Volleyball Guardian. So Ahab, tell me, have you ever decided to eat a protein bar while drinking a sugar-free energy drink? Uh, yes, I have. Is that, like, it, it ruins both flavors because there's just enough sugar in the protein bar that you can taste how god-awful your energy drink is. And then there's <laughs> just, like, and then you go back to the protein bar now that your palate's completely ruined, and it's just, ah! Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think I recommend it to anybody. Um, on that same note, drinking a protein shake and an energy drink back-to-back. Oh! Yeah, I do the uh, I do the, uh, the the ones that you can get at Costco. I think they're literally called like Premier Protein. Yeah, that's the ones I get. And can. if yeah, if you have nothing in your system, the peach ones taste delicious. But if you've had like a tiny bit of sugar, anything sweet, and you try to down one of those, you can immediately taste like all the artificial flavor, and it's just <laughs> oh yeah. You can only drink it right in the morning. Oh uh, yeah, that's I mean that's typically what I do anyway. Is my breakfast is. Generally, just a protein shake and, and a monster, and uh, that usually ties me over until lunch. But man, it, it it does a number on me. So well, it's it's uh something I've noticed in my weight loss is it doesn't matter what I eat for breakfast. So like I agree with you, and it's like a monster low carb and a protein drink because once lunch rolls around, no matter what you ate at breakfast, I could have like a full meal at Village Inn. Uh, for you, that's Waffle House. Uh, I can have a full meal at Village Inn and come back and I will just be starving come lunchtime. And I mean, you know exactly how that is, right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, I had 2,500 calories eating the scrambler bowl and uh, two waffles at Waffle House. But yeah, let's sure. Let's go to Denny's for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. So uh, for those of us joining us, this is the Moth's Misunderstanding podcast, the only podcast so powerful that we had to break off from the We Hate Anime podcast to do it. Uh, With me here is my friend Ahab. I've known you, what, two years now? Eh, Give or take. Yeah, whenever I got reactive in our military discord. Um, Ahab here, uh, we're going to talk two topics today. Uh, We're going to talk about what life is actually like in the military and we have two different perspectives because ahab i think you look back at your time in the military really fondly and i look back at it with just so much disdain and disgust that uh it's going to be pretty interesting Hmm. and then uh after we're done with that we're going to talk about mmos uh why free companies are like sex cults like why every MMO guild is some weird incestual sex cult. And uh, that's pretty much on the docket today. Two uh, topics that you think are completely different, but actually share a lot of similarities. It's going to be pretty interesting. So, uh, Ahab, uh, let's let's start with you. Um, When did you go in? Uh, What branch did you go in? What was your MOS or AFSC? And, uh, you know, what was your experience? (laughs) Okay, so uh, I joined the army back in 2008. Pretty much. And how old? How old were you? I'm 30 years old. Okay, so you joined at 18, yep. dumbass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was one of those one of those kids that uh, rolled out of high school graduation and right into a right into a recruiting Dude, office. The recruiter was just like waiting for you outside GameStop, like, "Hey, kid, hey, kid." You're going to be 18 by the time you graduate basic, right? You want to kill people? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, um, signed up and I went into an MOS that actually doesn't exist anymore. It was uh, 15 Juliet. It was uh, armament, electronic, and avionics repair for uh, the OH-58D Kiowa Warrior helicopter okay i was gonna say like how is maintenance of anything not an a- mos anymore and then that was wise because that helicopter doesn't exist anymore precisely yeah it's um big army decided that they didn't need small light armed reconnaissance helicopters anymore and i don't know somebody up in the pentagon paid somebody or hung out under somebody's desk long enough to convince them that yeah the apache can do everything a kiowa can do and that just wasn't the truth 
But, no, but you know, it's it's the same thing with the B-17 bomber, where we're never going to retire the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Weren't we supposed to retire it like a decade ago, and it's still in service? Uh, I think it was actually more like two decades, something like that. Like it's... Well, it's like we were, we were originally going to retire it at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, and then at the end of Desert Shield, and then... <laughs> yeah, um, there's just been so many different times where they find a justification to keep keep that thing flying keep them in just everything about them they're just like yeah we, we still need these even though you know they're decrepit and they're, <laughs> they're the frames have all these hairline stress fractures and we constantly have to repair them and they're these huge money pits but well you know it's it's like the el camino man you you can't make a classic any better you can just put a new engine in it just go grab a wonder bread truck steal the engine out of it boom pop that in el camino Best car you'll ever own. Yeah, yeah, I, I can agree with that. Um, in the case of the Kiowa, um, <clears throat> there was a lot of plans to release a a Block Two, the the second or rather the third generation version of this helicopter. Um, it originally started off in Vietnam as an unarmed reconnaissance helicopter. Reconnaissance. Yeah, like. The, um, the only thing you had was the M16 that the like you know the co-pilot would kind of stick out the window like yeah yeah more or less I mean um, actually uh, let me retract on that um, so in Vietnam there was there was a predecessor to it the what was it UH three or something to that effect it was anyway it was an ugly small no panels on it kind of thing and they were just so getting, if they got shot with a pistol it would hit the pilot yeah like they they were just not protected at all the, the biggest benefit was great visibility easy to fly and they were quick so yeah. along came the next generation of reconnaissance helicopters and that's where the oh 58 came into play riding off the success as well as the failures of it's it's early predecessors so right um you know basically through through experience they realized wow um the bad guys really don't like it when our guys are flying around taking pictures of them in their bases and stuff and they tend to get shot up a lot so we need to do something about that and just over time and mission after mission and just looking at the data and just kind of piling all the ideas together Eventually, uh, the DOD as well as Bell and, you know, some other conglomerates and bureaucracies and whatever, they came up with the Kiowa Warrior, which featured um, just all, all sorts of upgrades. More powerful engine, uh, main transmission that could handle more. It, they changed it from a two-blade main rotor up to a four-blade main rotor, which came with its own benefits like more stable flight and more lift generation um they added the weapon pylons which featured a quick disconnect um jettison feature so if say uh it was originally designed for like the rocket pods once the pods were empty they were they were meant to be single use so you know seven shots so it would drop the weight so you'd say fuel exactly um, that's not how it turned out, but the idea was there. Uh, and instead they used it as a quick disconnect sort of system where it's literally two hooks to lock in the, uh, the weapon system. And then they connect it up to the electronics and it's good to go. And then, perfect. Yeah. So it's, um, and you're actually one of the rare people, uh, you are, uh, and I almost did this as well, but that would have been a disaster and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, you're one of those people who actually took his MOS with him when he left. Uh, now, if I recall, because you're 30, there's no way you did you did 20 years. So, did you quit after one enlistment? After two? How long did you stay? Uh, yeah, I was I was a one and done kind of guy. So, did, were you on a two year or were you on a what? Because um, when I went in, we were only allowed to do four year or six year. There was no in between. Yeah, with the Army, it really depends. Um, So with my MOS specifically, it was a minimum six years active duty, no questions asked. So Okay, because it was that expensive to train you. Uh, In the Air Force, 
if you do an AFSC like uh, like network security stuff like that, mm-hmm. you are required to sign a six year right off the bat. Like anything that gets you top secret security clearance. Yeah. So no, I I know exactly what you mean. Um, so yeah, so you did six years. Now when you went in, like, you know, did did you like were you would you say coming out that you overall had a good experience in the military and why you, while you may not ever reenlist, like you enjoyed it. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of things that I enjoyed and then there's a lot of things that I didn't. Um, the way that I like to joke around with people is that 99% of the time, it just kind of sucks. You know, you're out having to pick up cigarette butts in a parking lot and you don't even smoke. You know, or yeah, exactly, you, yeah. Like you're getting woken up at like two in the morning because some guy in a different unit that just happens to live in the same barracks as you got pulled over and got a DUI and then got into the got into a fist fight with the MPs and now he's running around naked on base somewhere, and you're the one having to suffer from that because we, uh, you know, yeah, we 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 had something actually very similar to that happen. Um, my story is actually a lot more short than yours is uh, as far as that goes. I signed up for a four-year enlistment, and what happened was I got off my mission. I got kicked off my mission about a year early. Uh, apparently, developing anorexia is not good for your mental health. And uh, I met a girl pretty much immediately, and we dated. Uh, we hung out for about six months. We dated for about a month, and then afterwards, like, yeah, we should probably get married. And so over the course of a year, we ended up in this relationship where we got married, and then she was going back to college, and I realized, hey... I don't have any marketable skills to do anything with. So I, uh, I, I went in and I went up to the air force, like recruiting station. And, and that was my first mistake was going to the air force because for what I like to do in life, I should have gone into the Navy because you know, those dicks ain't going to suck themselves. <laughs> um, but, uh, I went to the air force. The problem with the air force is every dumbass kid who thought they were so cool because they got into their school's network because the teacher never changed the guest user for off administration rights goes into the air force. Like every brain dead superiority complex, just mongo bongo idiot kid that, you know, Oh, I, I use 4chan. I'm not a normie. Like that. Those are the guys who goes into the air force every single time. Do you know how many furries are in the air force? Probably more than I care to know about. (laughs) I have no tattoos. And in the four months that I was waiting to get out processed, uh, I probably went with six guys to get furry tattoos at San Antonio. So like, like these, it it is just the air force is the worst when it comes to just like the type of people it, it kind of, and the thing is the Navy has a lot of the same AFSCs like, the, the Navy and the Air Force run scarily similar AFSCs and MOS. I think the Navy does MOSs, right? Um, you know what? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, you know, me being an Army guy, Army, you know, yeah. I, I, I would just call them MOSs. I think they yeah. address them as ratings. It, it, whatever. Let's, you know, for because I was in Air Force, I call them AFSCs. MOS is probably more universal. But a lot of their MOSs are actually, they run parallel to ours. So, like cryptology, uh, stuff like that. A lot of the stuff they do behind computers is not dissimilar to the Air Force. Just they, like, once you get into cybersecurity, that becomes entirely the jurisdiction of the Air Force. Hmm. Um, but I, my first mistake was going into the Air Force. And my other mistake was not going in open technical. Because there's, uh, for people who don't know, when you go into the Air Force, that, or when you go to, to a military recruiter, there's two ways you can go. You can get a guaranteed job bid, or, and, and the problem with that is, especially in 2011, we were in the middle of a recession. So, like, everybody was joining the military. Um, when you get a ger- guaranteed job bid, you're basically told, like, hey, this is your AFSC. If you pass BMT, you're in. Like, you, you got that job. Uh, and I'm guessing by the sounds of it, you were guaranteed your gig as a mechanic, right? Yeah, it's um, it's, a, it's a little different with the Army. Basically, when when you're going in you sign on to an MOS right out of the gate. There's no bid. Um, There's either a slot or there's not a slot. So depending on your, your ASVAB score and, you know, whatever else factors go into like what MOS has become available to you, um, you know, they compile a list and at the end of 
the uh, the session in maps, you know, they'll sit you down with a liaison and go, okay, here's what you qualify for. And obviously yeah. the smart boys are going to have a lot more open to them. Uh, yeah, it's, and I got stories about low ASVAB scores, but uh, <laughs> just, just so anybody knows on the outside, ASVAB scores are not actually a good grade for your intelligence. Um, the fact that, some of the kids that I saw with really high ASVAB scores blew my mind because a lot of the questions are practical knowledge. And like, if you don't have a knowledge of how basic, you know, like lawnmower engines work or how to do carpentry or how to hammer through masonry, you won't actually get a full mark on your ASVAB score because the questions are so diversified that like, I, I met one person who got a perfect ASVAB score and the dude peed himself for two months straight. So like... <laughs> ASVAB scores are not very good, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you got a high ASVAB score, congratulations, you're on the short bus with a helmet. Like, <laughs> I, it, it's it, it, it's ASVAB scores are abysmal. But um, yeah. So with us, it was I got uh, I scored a ninety, and they told me like you can have any job in the Air Force because I think it's seventy eight. You can have any job. Like seventy eight is the highest requirement for any job in the military. Ooh. And uh, so they're like, you can have any job, but there are no jobs available. Like, I think at the time, and they couldn't guarantee me a job at all. They're like, we literally have no jobs available right now. And I was like, oh, okay. And they're like, okay, so uh, which of the three generals do you want to go into? And so it's like open technical, open general, open mechanical. You would have basically, if you were in my shoes, ended up in open mechanical. And that's like, you are going to fix equipment. Like, that, that, that's it. You're going to either fix pumps you're going to fix uh, vehicles, you're going to fix aircrafts, you're going to you know, run fuel to fuel lines, like you're going to do something. Um, yeah. And then there's open t technical, which is what I should have done, but I'm a dumbass. Um, and open technical is basically, you are going to sit behind a computer desk doing something. You are going to either monitor the nuclear reactor levels, uh, you are going to, you know, you might do cyber surety, uh, you might operate a drone. But, like, you are open technical, so you're going to do something with a keyboard. And then there's open general, which is literally every other job. <laughs> Pest management, uh, with us, security forces, we're military police. Uh, security forces, pest management, line cook, accountant, air traffic controller, all that falls into open, open general. And, like, an idiot, rather than get a job and just go, hey, what's available in open technical? I was like, yeah, I'll go in open general. Uh, and they're like, what five jobs would you like? And I'm like, uh, fireman sounds good. Cyber surety sounds good. And that wrote a death sentence for me right there on the spot. Because when I went through and I graduated BMT at week six, when they're pretty sure you're going to graduate BMT, because we had nine weeks and zero week doesn't count. So it was eight weeks. Hmm. Uh, we had eight weeks. And once they're sure that you're going to graduate at like week six, the end of week six, they bring you in, sit you down. They're like, okay, everybody gets your jobs. Well, most of you already have your jobs, except for like the idiots who went in open. And I was like, wait, what? Oh, no. <laughs> because like week three, they sit you down and they show you what's available. And because I failed the death perception test, I never got to be a drone operator and bomb children. You know, like one of my biggest regrets. Mm. Um, sorry, that's really dark. And obviously I don't mean that, but <laughs> anybody who's actually been in the military knows exactly. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a certain level of... Uh... <clears throat> A certain level of thick skin and humor that comes with literally every branch of the military, even the half your, branch. Your humor, uh, the Coast Guard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you you get so dark in the military. Like I, I think by the time I was done, uh, one of my bunk mates was talking about necrophilia, and I just didn't even notice. <laughs> yeah, I was. He was sitting there. He goes. He goes. You know what? The weirdest thing, Airman Moth, because I like left an E two. Like, you know what the weirdest thing? I'm like, what's that? He's like, this chick's ass was so cold when I was taking her from behind last night. I had to check to make sure she had a pulse. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, that's, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, okay, all right, moving on then. And you're Airman First Class, so technically you outrank me, damn it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so, uh. You know, we I went and opened general, and written on the board was the most common AFSC in the Air Force, which is uh, security forces, military police. 
And they're like, okay, so the idiots who went in open general, uh, you know, like they were they were crapping on the ones of us who went in open. They're like, for those of you who went in open general, why? <laughs> and I was just like, oh gosh. Oh, that's, so I that's opened, not good. <laughs> I, I open up my book and it's just security forces. And now I'm gonna I'm gonna rant about security forces real quick. Um security forces has an ASVAB score requirement of 33. It is the lowest ASVAB score requirement in the military. Period. Like, I, 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 they will not let you in the military if your ASVAB score is lower than three, 33. And at the time I was going in, uh, they wouldn't let you in if your ASVAB score was lower than 55. So, uh, to give you an idea, pest management, which is basically knocking bird's nests down with a broom... <laughs> <laughs> requires an ASVAB score of 35. Now, security forces gets the big guns. I trained with an M249. Like, I get the big guns. And so you have a bunch of people who are just barely above high-functioning Down syndrome, and you give them the scariest weapons you can use. <laughs> I mean, obviously we're not artillery. Like, you know, obviously I'm not flying a bomber or anything. But, like, as far as what you can give a soldier on the ground, I played with all of it. Like, we absolutely did, because we were infantry. Uh, so it's just, I'm sitting here, and I remember being at the firing range one day. Or no, I was, I was doing breach and clear, because uh, as I was going through tech school, I was doing breach and clear. And I remember thinking to myself, I have a gun loaded with blanks. If I put a gun loaded with a blank up against my arm, the blowback from, like, the gas is going to, like, cause a welt. Like, blanks are not non-lethal weapons you could you can mess yourself up with a blank you could you could definitely cause serious injury with it if you if you put yeah. that muzzle right against your skin and pull the trigger yeah you're you're doing something not good to yourself yeah exactly like it, it for comparison if you got like a paintball gun uh unload the paint pellets and just like put the barrel against your skin and pull the trigger and feel that like gush of air now imagine if that gush of air was amplified by the fact that it's gunpowder and not co2 and even though the bullet will never fire, just imagine like that sheer force, like up against your eyeball or something. Yeah. Um, and not to mention, there's also all the stuff that isn't burnt off yet. So now not only do you have the hot gases from the expanding gunpowder that is burning, but you also have the stuff that hasn't caught on fire yet and is also coming yeah. out of the barrel with those hot gases. Yeah, so I remember sitting there, like, shooting blanks at a chest because one of the instructors was hiding in the chest. And uh, I remember just sitting there thinking to myself, like, wow, I have a bunch of, like, Downs patients running around with firearms. Like, one of them had a Cheeto launcher, which was the uh, the M60 grenade launchers, but they would give us, like, the Cheeto rounds. Yep. So, and, and the Cheeto rounds, for people who don't know, it's just, it's a grenade packed with dust, orange powder. Yeah. And I just, I remember thinking, like, how do none of us die? <laughs> like, how do none of us die in training, ever? Yeah. The, and, uh, yeah, so it, it was just, the 33 ASVAB score, and there were people in my class when I went through who had to get waivers because they could only score 17 on the ASVAB. Oof. And I'm just, I'm sitting here like, I, I'm actually scared for my life. In, in this AFSC. And uh, going back, actually, I went into BMT right as my branch of the military, like right as Lackland Air Force Base, was going through a huge Me Too movement because it was found out that like the commander, the colonel in charge of BMT, uh, he had a private sex cult where they were basically raping the female trainees. Oh, that... And it had been going on for like, a, you know what I'm talking about, right? I do, yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah, that was a huge deal. And so my dumbass uh, had to go through so much sex training afterwards, like because of this guy's decision. So like we were, uh, we weren't allowed to have sister flights at the time. It was like, um, and, and I mean actual sister flights. I don't just mean like sister flights. Um we, all the female trainees were like being put in their own barracks with like female, uh, female sergeants and whatnot. Like it was nuts. The amount of stuff we were doing under lockdown. Yeah. I, I remember hearing about that from the army side of things. Cause, um, 
you know, there, there was just constant, uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault prevention briefings where, you know, they just basically stuff a whole ton of people into a tiny room, turn on the heat and then beat you over the head with PowerPoint slides until you either of STDs. Yeah. Like they, they just, I don't mean to take away from the efforts of trying to reduce sexual harassment or sexual assault or anything like that, because it is important to, put that under lock and key when you're talking about the military where you know you need to and should be able to trust literally everyone to your left and right there should not be any doubt in your mind that one of those people next to you might have ulterior motives and they involve hurting you in some way oh yeah no uh it's uh i agree with you that being said i was basically I, 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 I think like you, like I said, you had a good, uh, you had a good feeling when you left the military, like you felt it might've made you a better person or something. Like I'm one of those people who believe that my stint, all I got out of it was a VA home loan and my knees still work. Cause I got out early. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, there was, there was plenty of good and bad when it comes to my own personal experience. I, I try to look back on it focusing on the good because you know there is a lot of pride and there is a lot of uh self-confidence born from the the drive and ability to go and do something that most people in their lives won't ever do yeah and it was um actually a huge motivator for me when i was going through uh because i i got in and my mile and a half because the air force uh so we're I found out there's actually a lot of similarities to the Army PT scores. Uh, At the end of the day, I think we technically do less than you, but we have to do more faster. So I think you guys, it's like you have to do 50 push-ups in two minutes. Uh, it's been for like if if you were like let's say you were 19 and you had to get the young man PT scores and you had to score 90 or higher, it's like 50 push-ups in two minutes uh 60 sit-ups in two minutes and then you have to get your two mile run in under like 14 minutes yeah uh oh man it's been <laughs> it's been a long time since i've had yeah. to think about it um yeah yeah i mean the point being that the army they focused more on like the physical strength portion of the PT test was all based on push-ups and sit-ups, and yeah, you had yeah. two minutes in both of those categories um, to get a high score at a younger age. Um, I want to say that the the number you were shooting for was like actually up around like seventy, like sixty-five, seventy push-ups, and then like no kidding, eighty-something sit-ups. Yeah, because for us, um, for, to get the 90, and, and just so people who aren't in the military know, uh, you only want to score the 90. It doesn't matter. There's no difference between scoring a 90 and a 100. Um, and and it's you want to score the 90 because that gets you promoted. Being great leadership, being good at your job does not get you promoted in the military. It's how fast you can run. Um, and so for us, it was you had to, to get a 90, it was you had to be able to do like 42 push-ups in a minute you had to be able to do like 40 some odd sit-ups in a minute which i i don't know how you can move the motion of your lower torso that well uh i'm a skinny dude and i struggle with like the 42 push-ups a minute um and you have to run a mile and a half in i believe 10 minutes and six seconds so once again we're running a less than you guys by 0.5 miles and that's a notable difference i don't care what anybody says half a mile is a notable difference when you're running uh, but if you count the numbers, we have to run that mile and a half about 30 seconds faster than you guys do. Yeah. Which, and then obviously you got that extra half mile. Yeah. <clears throat> which, I mean, in, in the same sense that half a mile is a major difference. So is that 30 seconds? Oh yeah. You will. I, I, I mean, the fastest I've run a mile and I'm now significantly more fit than I was in the air force. I managed to pull a mile in like six minute and 12 seconds the other day. And I was smoked. I had another three and a half miles to go. And I was like, Oh God. (laughs) 
Yeah, I think I think the best the best, <laughs> see I, I could always max my push ups and sit ups. That wasn't a problem because I yeah, I, I was always physically stronger, but where I suffered was my run. And yeah. I think the best run that I ever got, and again, with the army, it was two miles. Um, I think I, I think my best time was about 13 minutes flat. And yeah. that left me feeling like I was dying. <laughs> like I crossed the finish line, my legs buckled, I hit the ground and just rolled a couple of times. And then I just laid there and, just wondered if I was going to be able to get back up again in the next five minutes. Just like, oh God, that was terrible. I hope I never have to do that again. And I, yeah, yeah. I, I went into the Air Force at 186 pounds at five foot eleven, uh, and that's that's overweight. That's actually right before obese if you follow actual health charts. Mm. And my very first mile and a half was 18 minutes and 32 seconds, and I will never forget like how miserable that is because that's worse than like a brisk walk. <laughs> Uh, and it's, I found out that like six months after I graduated BMT, they were actually rolling people out of BMT who couldn't run the mile and a half in 18 minutes or less. So like I made it in and I like made it under the laser. Uh, but I think when I finished BMT, I ran the mile and a half in 11 minutes and 17 seconds, like two months of fitness training later. And I just remember looking at my sergeant being like, sir, training moth reports is ordered permission to puke <laughs> and he's like what's this weakness you ran it at 11 minutes and 15 seconds i got trainees over here doing it in seven and i'm like sir they ain't me <laughs> i always got in trouble i could i could tell bmt stories all day of all the stuff i got in trouble for i got i beat my face so much in the air force and that's that's a real thing when they talk about like drop down and give me push-ups the thing is they don't tell you how many push-ups they want you to do the most you're gonna hear is do it until i'm tired yep and uh i i oh gosh i just the 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 amount of like stupid stuff i went through in the air force uh i beat my face so much my favorite was uh training moth yes sir training moth reports is ordered moth where is your nose uh, <laughs> on your face and you just know at that moment you start beating your yeah. face until he tells you to stop see it's funny because like in in boot camp I didn't really I I can't say that I was like getting individually smoked too much like I wanted to kind of fly under the radar and just try to adjust to this radically different world that I had stepped into um but after that and moving into my first unit and getting settled into that, like that's where, that's where me messing with my peers really started to come out and it was never anything yeah. malicious, you know, like we're all, no, no, but it, it's, it's the stuff you do. It's hazing. Yeah. There's a reason we call it hazing. If you didn't like the guy, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. I mean, it's the, a lot of it was just harmless pranks, like being bored out on some fob in the middle of nowhere in northeast iraq it's like two in the morning there's nothing going on you're not out like having to do anything so you're just kind of hanging out in the hooch you know with some of your peers and you got one dude over in the corner turning a, a disposable camera into a homemade taser because he can and he wants to see if it'll work <laughs> And, you know, there's the other guy who's not paying attention to the first one who's leaning against a table with a metal top on it with their <laughs> hand firmly on that top. And the first guy goes over. And you know that guy is going to put that camera. Oh, yeah. And that's just, that's stuff that happens. There's just silly shenanigans. There's, you know, pranks and ways that we mess with each other in friendly, funny ways. And I'm sure somebody... <laughs> out there is probably like wait why would you tase your friend well because it's, it's funny. funny yeah <laughs> <you're bored. laughs> like, you know like when two days ago you know there was uh, a series of mortars rolling in towards the bunker you're you're hunkered down in you know the taser kind of seems harmless by comparison like <laughs> did you uh did you ever did you ever shake the can while someone was beating off in it <laughs> Um, no, I think there was kind of like a, like an unspoken 
truce when it came to private time. We had a uh, we had a guy, and, and this is like while I'm going through tech school, and and I'll tell you the story of why there's not a lot uh, a lot of stories post tech school in a minute. But um, we were going through tech school, and they just like you kind of crap out in the woods and whatnot. Like you know you you got to hold it and whatnot. Um, but we had this shared room where like four of us had to share a shower and I know like this is air force accommodation. So the fact that there's even a private shower between four guys is mind blowing. <laughs> and, uh, we had this one guy that just pissed us off because like he shot the thickest ropes. And the only reason we know that is because he would get out of the shower and the next guy in every time, like the drain would just be covered oh. in this guy's just ah oh, and God. like you know it too and like we would yell at the guy we'd be like dude can you just like waffle stomp it down please <laughs> oh and, no, uh, that's raunchy <laughs> oh yeah so like we we haze that guy for what he did for sure um but my personal favorite is throwing rocks at bigger rocks <laughs> which that is not something you will uh that is not something you will truly appreciate unless you've been in the military. Is just throwing rocks at bigger rocks. Like we're not even talking like you can just like you find a boulder and you'll just throw rocks at the boulder all day. Yeah. Or like you'll try to dislodge a rock in the boulder by hitting it with other rocks. Yeah. I, I'm sure like leading up to the explanation, there's people sitting there thinking, like, is this a metaphor? Is there like No, no. this is literally just throwing rocks at bigger rocks because it's there. Or, or my or my favorite, when you're getting disciplined and they you come out in the middle of the burning hot Texas summer and there's just empty canvas bags and a sand pile. Oh. And you have to fill the canvas bags with the sand, haul them a hundred meters, dump them out, and and there's like thirty there's thirty bags, but you're not allowed to carry more than one at a time, so the why there's thirty is beyond me. And you have to then just <laughs> move the pile from one end of the field to the other, and that's your punishment for the day. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, so it's, um, so just, just to kind of wrap up my story. So what happened is I got in open general and I got in security forces and my flight got crammed. And a flight is basically the group of people that you're with in your similar profession in the air force. And so what happened is there's supposed to be an attrition rate of about 5% in every class. And the military plans for that. Like uh, a lot of airlines overbook flights expecting about 5% of flyers to not get on the flight. Um, so they, they we have expected attrition. So our flight was 80 people and all the, secure, or all the special forces dropouts rolled into our flight. Hmm. And so what that meant is an 80 person flight is suddenly 110 people because basically everybody who failed to be pararescue, everybody who failed to be a uh, combat controller and all those guys ended up in our flight. And so I don't want to be here. I wouldn't open general. So me and these guys are actually in the same boat where we're not really supposed to be here, but the air force couldn't place us in any other job. So we have 110 people and we don't get enough deployment orders. And so one of the guys uh, got stuck to Colorado, which was right by where my wife was going to college. And I got stuck to North Carolina, which would have been a death sentence for me because North Carolina is a rapid deployment base. Like you basically do six months in, six months out, which six months in, six months out translates to nine months in, three months out mm -hmm. because some D-bag uh, National Guardsman is promised a 90-day deployment and he's going to get a 90-day deployment no matter what. Um, so you, uh, you're basically screwed there. Uh, so I traded with the guy in Colorado. I said, okay, I'll take your job. You take mine. And doing that actually dislodged both of us because before we were both guaranteed jobs on our bases when we left. Now we were random numbers. Like I was told I could go to Colorado and he was told he could go to North Carolina and he ended up going to North Carolina. Um, uh, me, I completed my training and then that was the summer like 2011 2012 maybe colorado caught fire oh uh yeah it was 2012 colorado caught fire that year and the next year colorado caught fire and what they won't do is like so if i'd been in and i'd been like say fuel line runner like uh, my entire job was to refuel airships yeah 
then and I cross trained to a different AFSC and went into security forces, they would let me fly anywhere. But because I was a fresh squid, like right out of BMT, they basically were like, yeah, no, uh, Colorado's on fire right now. We can't put you in a hostile base because I guess being on fire was viewed as like hostile territory at that point. <laughs> So uh, I missed my job, and because there was no attrition, and we were overbooked by about 10%, they couldn't even get me the job. So I'm security forces, and I'm like, so am I supposed to do security forces at Lackland then? And they're like, no. Do you know how many guys just sit in Lackland doing nothing because they're like security forces who we couldn't place? Because security forces is the overflow job of the Air Force. Uh, I'm like, okay, so what do you want me to do? And so I became... And these guys exist. If you ever go into the military and you end up security forces, you will meet these guys. There is at least three of them at every point in time. And it's guys who can't be placed. So our entire job, because they want to pay us, is we get the guys off the bus when they drive three blocks from their training barracks to uh, where they're going at Lackland, which uh, they, they, go to the, they, they go to these bunk houses. And it's really funny because at any given point during the year, like, half the bunkhouses are inoperable because they're in perpetual repair. Um, but uh, you basically have these, uh, they make the, the trainees sit at this dorm that's basically like a glorified prison for a week. And then once the class ahead of them, uh, the class that's like 12 weeks ahead of them graduates, they move into the official security forces barracks. And so my job during week zero is to march these guys all up and down to their do not rape classes uh, if there's no classes going on, I have to take them into like this clubhouse where they just chill and do nothing, but they're not allowed to have fun. Um, and so you basically spend a week with every new group that comes in. And I got so many LORs and LOCs in that job. It wasn't even funny. There's a reason I never got promoted past E2. Um, because basically what it is, is like, it's, there's six of us at any given point in time. And it only requires two of you throughout the day to take care of these 60 chuckling morons that smell like hot ass <laughs> and so half of us would play hooky i mean once you get a stripe on your sleeve nobody's gonna pay attention to you so uh it's the smooth sleeves that everybody pays attention to because they're like so are you in bmt and you took your training belt off like what's going on yeah very suspect yeah and so i i actually back when i was still a smooth sleeve i was <laughs> drinking an energy drink and like a sergeant with a with the uh with the hat which you know is a training sergeant come sprinting at oh, me no. and he's like trainee what the hell are you doing and i still have a little bit of ptsd at the time and i'm like it actually i had to catch up with myself and i was like uh i'm running errands for the chaplain because i was looking for jobs to do at one point and he's like what unit do you report to i'm like none i'm in holding until i can ship off to my base and it goes oh carry on <laughs> It's like, I hate you guys. Uh, but basically, <laughs> I did that for about a year. Like, they couldn't place me. And then when it came time for me to go to Colorado again, it caught fire again. Oh, jeez. And so eventually, somebody, like, they just came up to me. And I don't even remember who came up to me. But somebody's like, do you want to go home? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, tell you what, we'll cut your contract, give you an honorable discharge, and you can go home. Huh. And I was like, okay. So I served 18 months and I left. See, and that's, that's my story. Huh. See in the so, army, it, it, it would have turned out a little differently, which yeah. I can't say that it would be better or worse, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it would be a, a needs of the army situation where, so they would retrain you, yeah, right? Like they would just be like, okay, well, uh, Hmm. You already went through boot camp, and you're here in AIT, but uh, extra special circumstance X Y Z happens, and now yeah. you can't do that. Uh, we're gonna have to put you where we need you. So, congratulations, you're now a 42 Alpha. You're gonna be a paper pusher behind a desk instead of yep. satellite communication specialist. Like, yep. And, and I think, I think what happened to me is I had so many like LOCs that they just wanted me gone, but because I didn't have like a single article 15, they couldn't dishonorably discharge me. So, or discharge under less than honorable circumstances. So they just gave me an honorable discharge and let me leave. Eh. 
So, in in my in my case with with the army, um, actually dialing it back before that, the really funny thing is I I actually tried to go to the air force first. Um, so big mistake, first mistake right there, Ahab. <laughs> yeah, I learned very quickly. I told you who belongs in the air force. Yeah, no, it's you know being being that high school kid who looks at anybody in a military uniform as like these 15 foot tall monoliths of justice and freedom. You're like, wow, they're so cool. But then you get in, you're like, wow, these guys are idiots. Dumb as hell. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Well, you know, so being that high school kid and not really having any more ideas on what I wanted to do with my life besides like turn myself around from the bad path that I was on and like try to make something of myself. I looked at the air force first because there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of, you know, unknowns that I couldn't really plan for. I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm getting into, but I know that, you know, I could probably do pretty well in the air force. I could probably get in pretty easily and like make something of myself. Well, so I started talking to a Air Force recruiter, and I wanted to be Mr. Big Bad F-22 mechanic. And uh, the short version is that I dealt with that for all of six months, and then that fell through when I went to MEPS. And I sat down with the liaison, and we started talking about everything, and he says, okay, well, what do you want to do? Like, what jobs do you want to want to try to get? And I said, well, I want to be an F-22 mechanic. You know, or I want to be a pilot, or I want to do like I want to do the cool stuff. I want to work on the cool stuff, or I want to play with the cool stuff. And this guy, and I'm not kidding, he literally just looks at me and he goes, "Well, uh, we don't have have any slots for that right now, so maybe you can try back in six yep. months." Yeah, I was like, "Excuse me," like I was so. Yep. Nope, that's exactly how. It yeah, is. like I was, you know, in my late teens fiery angst i was so angry about it i was like all right screw the air force like i'm not waiting six months i want something now i want to go i want to get the hell out of my hometown and i want to go learn to do something maybe play with some guns and have a good time doing it so uh a family friend who was a recruiter at the time um my stepdad he gets on the phone with him he says all right lenny you know, Ahab, he, he needs, he needs some reassurance here and he needs some help and he's, he wants to join the military and he's not wanting to go to the air force anymore because they basically screwed him over or whatever. Why don't you come talk to him? So he did a uh, little background about this guy at the time that he was a recruiter. He had probably six or seven years in the army, uh, as a combat medic. And he was, he'd already had several deployments under his belt at this point. And he was, he was part of the initial invasion into Iraq. In Okay, so he was Operation Desert Shield. No, I'm talking the new one, like. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, all right. Yeah, no, this is, this is the second time we went into Iraq in, uh, what was it, 2003, I think. When things yep, were because, especially uh, bad. you know, Bush Jr. couldn't be beaten by his father. Yeah. So he was part of that deployment, and he saw pretty much every bad imaginable thing you can come up with. So here's me as a 17, 18-year-old Ahab talking to this guy, and he goes, all right, so what do you want to do? I had been turned off of the idea of trying to work on Raptors because, well, the Air Force is the only ones that have them. The Army doesn't have them. So I was like, all right, well, I was a volunteer EMT for a little while in my hometown. What about being a combat medic? And I'm not kidding. This dude grabs me. Just one hand grabs, like, my entire collar of my shirt, and he pulls me in close, and he looks me dead in the eye. He goes, I am not letting you do that. I do that. Yeah, because as fun <laughs> as it is to be called Doc for the rest of your life, uh, you see stuff you don't want to see. Exactly. Ever. And he was like, I, I am not doing that. I will never be able to live with that. And your parents would kill me. And I was like, okay, well, what else is there? He's like, whatever you want, man. I already looked at your scores and what you could qualify for. Yeah, like, like literally anything 
at all. Yeah, and so I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll give it some thought. You know, like I was thinking something more along the lines of like infantry or tanker or Cav Scout. <laughs> and Cav Scout. <laughs> you just wanted like that's the thing. I didn't actually want a high action job, Ahab. I just wanted a job. Like I was content to be a fireman. Yeah, well, that was the thing. Is like. The second time of considering going into the military, I was more open to the idea of what at the time seemed like this grand, illustrious, glory-seeking job where, you know, I'm the best of the best and I'm going to get to do everything I want and uh, maybe shoot some people along the way. And, uh, you know, obviously, now I know it doesn't always play out that way, you know? No, no. But... I. Uh... Yeah, I was I was just gonna say, do you remember how like dehumanizing they did? Like like by the time you were done with I think for you it was probably deployment training, but like by the time you were done, you did not see Middle Easterners as people, like at all. Well, because at no point did they refer to them in your training using humanitarian like words. Like Middle Easterners, Iraqis, it was like Haji, it was I mean, I had a white dude, and and I apologize. Like, I, I I don't like saying racial slurs on my podcast, but like, I had a white dude who would just scream like the word. He's like, "You got to be aware for the sand niggers with guns," and it's like, "There's 30 black guys staring at you as you say this," and I'm like, "How does he not get jumped?" <laughs> Like, by the time I was done with, like, technical training, I could have probably killed a Middle Eastern person and not even thought about it. Yeah. Like, that's how bad it is. I think it was it was a little different for us because in in my specialty, the only, the only local nationals that I would typically deal with were either ones that were allowed to conduct merchant businesses on base or... Oh, great. Or guys who are not supposed to be where they're at because the nature of my job wasn't just working on the helicopters. Um, like I said, the title was, uh, um, bit misleading. Yeah. It was armament, electronic avionics repair. However, there was also a lot of focus on the armament side of things where not only if you, if they need a gunner, you're the gunner. Well, no, because the Kiowas were two seaters and they had two pilots and that's it. You're not fitting anybody else in them. Uh, however, they needed ground support for ammunition and fuel. Oh, right. So, so you, you, you got out yeah. there. There, there was, there was times where, you know, me and my guys and, our fuelers and our trucks or wherever we were using to get there, we'd go outside the wire, go set up somewhere or uh, more commonly would be on like small fobs here and there that are near where the helicopters are operating. It really just kind of depended on the mission. Um, but sometimes there would be special circumstances where, you know, I get, I get tapped on the shoulder and go, Hey, Ahab, grab your gear, grab your guys go down to the ADAC, you're hopping on Black Hawk tail number this at this time, and you're going somewhere. Okay, what am I doing? You're going somewhere. Okay, cool. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Was I... No, no, I, 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 I know that. It's, uh, hey, Moth, wake up. What's up? Uh, we need you to go guard something. Uh, I marched troops at, like, four hours. Like, yeah, well, you know, uh, D Jenkins can take care of this. Go guard something. I'm like... Okay, so I wake up and I walk over like half tucked in my uniform, like trying to do my pant legs, <laughs> and it's just the volleyball storage. Oh, jeez! And they're like, "Why? Why am I guarding this?" Oh, because the sergeant normally—it's like a twenty-four hour job is to guard this the the volleyballs. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> oh, like, uh, pure air. But force. you know, it's an air conditioned shack that has uh, a router hooked up, so you can sit there and beat your dick the whole time you're there because nobody ever checks on you. So as far as places to go, it's not bad. Yeah, I can think of worse. But, yeah, things. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, like so. <sighs> excuse me. So we would we would set up. We'd have our fuel and our ammunition, rockets, Hellfire missiles, 50 cal ammo. We even had stuff for other aircraft at times, like. Uh, Apaches would come in every once in a while and we might have to load some 
uh, 30 millimeter ammunition for their chain guns. Um, which I don't like loading Apaches. Like they just, they take forever. And the job is, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and try to make it seem like my job was like this it's inherently glorious. super, super dangerous thing. But like, there was a lot of danger in the fact that, you know, you're sitting on an exposed on area. Bombs. Yeah. Surrounded by high explosives, ammunition and fuel. Like, and when the helicopters are on the ground, they're a huge target because, yeah, you know, uh, Raven squad, which is what they were trying to cross train me into at one point. That's the exact same thing. I, it, I think it's called Raven shield, not Raven squad, but like you have to get out of a vehicle while it refuels and you're just a huge target. Yeah. Um, so there were times where, um, in the special circumstances where we had to be outside the wire to do our job, um, we actually, I'll, I'll share a specific instance where we did what's called a jump farp farp being a forward arming refueling point and mm. the jump farp being like we're setting up in the middle of nowhere yeah so when the helicopter needs to land refuel and reload they can set up close to the combat yeah. less downtime from the aircraft that are doing the fighting and you know more uptime doing their their uh their runs or their support or whatever they're doing so yeah that's horrifying because if anybody spots you guys it's over yeah we become a pretty pretty big target and there is there is there's one particular time where uh we set up we had we had a couple of aircraft that we flew out in which were basically just some some blackhawks and some chinooks because the chinooks were big and fast and capable of carrying a lot of stuff inside without having a sling load as where all the people were in the Blackhawks. So <clears throat> we fly out and they didn't tell us where we were. And this is, this is one of those situations where it was, I got tapped on the shoulder and they go, Hey, Ahab, grab your guys, grab your gear and get on the bird. You're going somewhere. And I go, where are we going? And they said, you're going somewhere. Just be there. I could have yep. been in Pakistan for all I know. I don't know. I didn't ask. All I knew is that I needed to be somewhere and I needed to do my job. And I was like, all right, cool. Good enough for me. So we set up and we, we offloaded what we needed to offload to set up the area. And we had, there was a, there was a raid going on where, um, try to be vague but also descriptive at the same time because i can't yeah because really you don't know it. what well seven years seven years after any event you can talk about it. it it's or is it 15 there's there's something but like after a certain point you can talk about pretty much anything you did unless it's like specifically classified otherwise yeah well so we we set up and there was there was a raid going on where I guess there was intelligence that uh, there was a terrorist cell or a leader or something like logistics operations, something going on. And taking this place out was going to be a really good thing for coalition forces. So um, <clears throat> they had Apaches and Kiowas and uh, I think the Marines also doubled down on it and they brought out some Super Cobras and like they were just messing this place up like a compound somewhere near where we set up. And uh, so basically the birds would go and they would do their strafing runs and whatever. And then they, they just lay down the hate and then come back, reload, head back out, lay down more hate, swing back, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, essentially we, we were just going nonstop, just bird would land they take off next bird lands. Oh gosh, yeah. And so during all of this, like we had guys that were pulling security, and there was a moment where there was a small group of insurgents who basically they I guess I don't know if they were looking for us or if they just happened to stumble on us, but they started they started taking shots at our position. And so there I am slamming rockets in the tube. And all of a sudden, oh. a bullet hole just boom right in the side of the right in the side of the Kiowa, right through the the aft door. Which thankfully it Oof. didn't hit anything. 
in, right. included. Oh, uh, that was actually that was a huge thing during uh, was it Vietnam where we saw the Apaches? Like those things would land and they would just be covered in oh bullet the holes. Hueys, yeah. Yeah, the Hueys. Yeah, you're right, the Hueys. Yeah. Yeah, that was the story I would always get told because one of my uh, one of my buddies, uh, similar to you actually, uh, his uh, not buddy, but like when I was in the church, uh, or well in the church when I was doing the youth program, um, they actually had that uh, where one of the fathers had been a Huey pilot and his son had become like an Apache pilot. And he's like, yeah, I've landed this thing. And I was surprised the rotors were still together because there were just so many holes in the rotors. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. basically, so you saw a bullet fly right by you. Yeah. It, it punched a hole right in the side of the door. And, uh, I mean, at the time, adrenaline took over training took over muscle memory kicked in and i just kept on moving um you know not to brag but i was i was very good at my job and i made sure that all of my guys were also very good at their job and we we had a, a lot of really good communication and teamwork so we could cut the time that 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 aircraft is on the ground down a lot because we yeah. trusted each other i put the bomb in the tube yeah like we could we could get things done faster and more efficiently because we were able to work as a team and then yeah, and that's how it yeah exactly be. and so we got we got these birds finished up because there there's two of them down on the ground we finish them up and these guys they pick up and they just swing a hard left turn and just go straight for where the rounds came from <laughs> and i mean they literally they just pop up over this this hill that was kind of off to our left and you just see them just start laying down hate on whatever was on the other side of it. Just a couple of rockets, just boom, 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 the machine gun fire. And you're just, you're feeling better because you're like, well, those guys who tried to ruin my day are now gone forever. Yeah, you know, it, there was like a split second where I was just thinking in the back of my head, like looking over my shoulder at the, the orange glow of fire coming over the hill. I was like, oh, hell yeah. America, fuck yeah. Yeah. Just that song just starts suddenly playing <laughs> yeah. in your head, and then you know the next air, the next set of aircraft come rolling in. They set down, and it just the ball keeps on rolling. Just keep going, boom, 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 boom. No, don't stop, don't slow down. Yep. No, I, I, yeah, I. Uh, un unfortunately, Ahab, um, I know that we were going to talk about free companies, but we we always have next time. I mean, I could talk about the stuff I've seen in MMOs all day. Uh, the, the reason we're probably going to cut the episode right now is you actually have a raid night tonight from six to nine. So I do, um, yeah, you still, you still play Final Fantasy. The thing is, I really do want to get back into MMOs because I love being a heel slut and just <laughs> quick side note, anybody who gets mad at the phrase heel slut doesn't play healer because every damn healer on the planet wears that term like a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> like every healer I know is like, hell yeah, I'm a heal slut. But guess what? If I don't do my job, the party gets wiped. And I know it's, it's a little bit more in final fantasy 14. It's a little bit more intrinsic. It's like, if everybody doesn't do their job, the party gets wiped. but it's like, yeah, but the party gets wiped significantly faster. If I don't do my job. Yeah. And I mean, even in final fantasy 14 specifically, like, in in the raids like it really only takes one person messing up to cause a, a, a party wipe so well maybe 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 i am a little bit cynical but like for me when i was playing and like i would do like the shiva fight and everything because the shiva fight was a big deal back when it first oh, came out yeah. like, the shiva fight was probably the hardest fight when it first came out um the shiva fight was it, honestly in my opinion you only need a good healer and a good tank nothing else matters like, and that's, that's if you're doing a five man fight. Now, if you're doing like the, the 10 mans and the higher numbers like that, like, yeah, you want to have more healers. You want to have like, you know, you want to have everybody be good at their jobs, but like, just like a five man going in, I've honestly survived those fights with just a healer and just a tank. Yeah. Um, there is, there, there is a, there is you can go back and, and still do those fights. And now nowadays with the level cap being 80 and classes being, Oh yeah. You could clear. Are, like, yeah. Uh, unless you level lock yourself and switch to classic mode, like you will just bloop, bloop, bloop. Yeah. Um, I will say 
the last the last thing I will say about Final Fantasy, um, the current raid tier as of right now, which is the second Eden's Gate or Eden's Choir or whatever the hell they're calling it, um, the fourth fight in that tier is it's something. And I mention it specifically because we were just talking about Shiva. It's, um, I don't know if people are going to be able to go back and clear it as easily when, you know, that becomes old content that you can just go back and redo. There's a lot. <laughs> and it absolutely oh, no, I, demands I, I, I everybody it. to be good at what they're doing. Man, I, I hate this Ahab because, like, I, I, I'm so busy. I want to play Final Fantasy fourteen. I want to be, like, when I say I was, you, you knew my class, but if I were to say, like, I was a Yu-Gi-Oh player, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, uh, I was, oh, gosh, I can't even remember the name of it right now because I jumped in for, like, two days during the expansion pack and jumped back out. Um, gosh, I was an Astrologian. And, like... That is such a cool class. Like, an entirely luck-based healing class is amazing to me. Um, but I just... I can't do it. Yeah. So, I uh, I, I think Final Fantasy fourteen is definitely the best MMO. It is the most polished MMO I've ever seen. I wouldn't say that it's my favorite MMO ever. I still think I'd give that to Tabula Raza. But there is not an MMO on the planet right now that I think is better than fourteen. Just overall. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. So, and you, you you generally play DPS, right? Actually, I'm a tank. Oh oh yeah yeah I forgot the tanks. I, I get I get a lot of the tank and the DPS classes mixed up in my mind because I know I shouldn't say this, but like they come off the same to me. Because <laughs> um, it's like the Black Knight or the 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 Dragoon or no like the Black Knight the Dark it's like Knight, is yeah. the Black Knight DPS or Dark Knight yeah is he a DPS or a tank I don't know I can't tell <laughs> I mean Dark Knight and Warrior you know Warrior I have always or, liked the joke that Warrior's just a DPS with a lot of health Yeah I can believe that and and they can pull aggro which that's all I need from a tank if a tank could pull aggro I can keep him alive Yeah and uh yeah, so ne next time, um, because I got actually pretty much every single one of my guests could come back at this point, um, because I've, I've interviewed other people now. Uh, next time I bring you back, we'll just talk about MMOs, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go into like just the weird stuff that happens. Uh, the big topic, and, and we talked about this a little bit beforehand, every MMO I've ever played, the moment I join a guild, it becomes a sex cult. And I don't think it's my fault. I just think like, all these guilds are sex cults. <laughs> and I mean, yours, yours was the only guild I ever joined where it wasn't a sex cult. And there was still a guy trying to role play his character while talking to me. And I was like, what the? Yeah, there's, like, I, there's some I, interesting I, people you meet. <laughs> I, like, I get it. It's an escapism thing. Like I made a big bar of lion character because I secretly wish I was a giant manly man. Like I get that, <laughs> but I'm not going to go up to you and be like, nuzzles and wuzzles you what's up dad Oof. or daddy yeah well just don't hang out on ball mug and you'll be all right ball M oh gosh is is ball mug the like i i don't want to be i i don't want to be a dick like uh i i, I yeah i don't want to be a dick but like what what server is it where it's like known quietly as the lgbt server uh i don't think that it's I don't think there's a server specifically known as the I swear LGBTQ plus whatever. Not trying to insult anybody, just and I don't know it by No, heart. no, no. It's 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 fine. It, it's 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 fine to call a pot a pot. Um, or like I don't know. It's fine to call it a a, a raspberry bush. Raspberry bush. You get the metaphor, like. I swear there's a server, though, and it was, like, originally supposed to be just, like, it was the server that, like, if you were gay, your buddies got you on there because it was, like, the most welcoming server. And I guess in recent, I swear it's fairy, uh, I, in the most recent years, it's just been, like, underage ERPing, and that's the entire server now. Yeah, there, I'd, I'd have to say that's probably Balmung. I don't know about the underage part, but... Uh, 
I think it, as far as Crystal Data Center goes, Balmung is like known as like the ERP server. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll talk about it. I mean, uh, if if we pull another episode, and we actually end up talking about MMOs. We'll talk about it because it's just. I don't think I've ever played an MMO except for like maybe Firefall where I didn't end up in some weird sex cult. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> I think it's my fault at this point. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was it. Uh, this, this episode we talked about military and why you should never, ever, ever join as anything other than an officer. <laughs> and uh, we'll catch you guys later. Uh, Ahab doesn't have any social media to plug, but I got their Mothman um, on Twitter. And we always got the podcast. So if you guys want Ahab back, just ask and we'll talk about mmos we can talk all day about that crap because uh i think the first time i joined your server like the very first thing we did is like we saw like three guys sitting on each other's faces role-playing in public yeah yeah right there in limps of limits and I, yep and i have the screen caps to prove it <laughs> so uh all right well thank you ahab and uh for everybody else we'll catch you next yeah. time thanks for having me yep thanks for being here